every time we talk about enzymes, of course, the idea is pretty much related to speed, given that the purpose of the enzyme is to make a reaction faster. And when we're talking about rates, fast, speed, and things like that, we're delving into a field called kinetics. So there's such part of enzyme study called enzyme kinetics. Now, as an introduction to the field of enzyme kinetics, let's go back to an equation that pretty much gives us the rough sketch of what an enzyme is supposed to do. Again, an enzyme is supposed to bind to a certain reactant or substrate to form an enzyme substrate complex. The enzyme can convert the substrate into a product and then let it go later on. Now, moving from that, the product is actually something that will help us measure a so-called turnover rate. Basically, the turnover rate is how much substrate is converted to product at a given time frame. Of course, if I can make a lot of product in a short span of time, that means that the turnover rate is high. All right, And what does that tell us? That means that, well, of course, given that the product originally was the substrate, if I have a lot of substrate, then I have a lot of product. And if I have a lot of product, the turnover rate is high, then I could pretty much say that the enzyme is quite busy, it's productive because it's doing a lot, so we can say that the activity of that enzyme is high as well. Or uh, in other words, we call it the V, or the enzyme velocity. Therefore, we can make this assumption or relationship that the amount or concentration of substrate and the enzyme velocity or activity are directly proportional. And when we try to graph that substrate versus velocity, we're supposed to get a straight line. Right? Direct proportion, as a review, of course, it should give us a straight line. And that is what you are seeing right here. So here, if I add substrate, the velocity goes up, and we get something like this one. And then I add more substrate, I add more, uh, the velocity goes higher, and then this, the line continues to go up. But here, you can see clearly that the, the, the line kind of plateaus or flattens at this point. And of course, while we have explained the reason for this portion, this is something that we need to discuss further. Like, why in the first place did we even get something like this? Uh, in in, in uh, technical terms, this is called the first order part of the equation or the plot, and this is the zero order. Uh, given the idea that here at the zero order portion, no matter how much I add the substrate, the velocity does not anymore depend on it, and, and so we get something like this. Now, let's imagine I have here four enzyme molecules, just four, and you may ask, doesn't the body have like millions of enzymes? Every individual enzyme is supposed to be at least several thousand, and, and I agree, yeah, of course, we can have like literally millions of just one enzyme in our body, but that doesn't take away the fact that our enzymes are limited. Even if we say, hey, um, the body is supposed to have like 10 million molecules of that enzyme, but, but what if I have 10 million substrates? It's not impossible. So what if I have the first you know, substrate here, and then this one binds with the enzyme? So here we have a 1 is to 1 proportion, that's still a straight line. And then the second one, one is the one also, then the line continues. And then the line continues. And then the line continues. But, of course, we have to deal with the reality that what if I have an excess of substrate? What happens? Will the substrates have anywhere to go? None, right? So, therefore, even if I continue adding substrate, meaning going to the right, does the velocity go up? Of course not, because there is no enzyme to accommodate them anymore. So while we go to the right, since the velocity is not going up, our enzymes are not anymore there because they're all occupied. Then we go to the right, but we never go up anymore, which is basically this portion. So basically, this gives us the idea that enzymes are limited and can be completely filled up, or in other words, saturated. So we can actually say that enzymes are saturable, and that explains why this initially straight line plateaus here. And probably the point here wherein we start to reach this flat part, and this is of course just an assumption, we can call this the saturation point.
Okay, and this plot here is actually called a michaelis minton plot, and the kinetics that uh, underlies the principle for getting this plot is called michaelis minton kinetics, which pretty much applies for all our enzymes. Whenever we have a michaelis minton plot, there are two main variables or two main um, data that we can derive from it, which would be increasingly important as we discuss more about enzymes. The first one, we need the saturation point, or basically the highest possible velocity here, okay? And then we trace it all the way here to get a certain value of velocity, which basically is the highest attainable velocity for this plot. Since it is the highest, we can call this the maximal velocity, or the Vmax. Now, another data that we can get from this requires us to get one half of the Vmax. Of course, this is just arbitrary. And then we trace it to the michaelis menten plot here, and then we go down, and this is what we call the Km, wherein Km actually stands for the Michaelis constant. Now, literally speaking, Michaelis constant is easy to define. You just look at the graph. So without me writing the definition, I can say that the Km is essentially the concentration of the substrate that is equivalent to one half of the maximal velocity in the plot. But that doesn't really give us a lot of uh, meaning or, 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 or reason to memorize it, right? So what's the importance of the Km in the first place? Km actually has something to do with something we call affinity. Affinity is the strength of binding of a substrate to the enzyme. In other words, affinity tells us how good the substrate would like to be with the enzyme. Of course, uh, that's an important uh, thing because the requirement for a reaction to happen is for the substrate and the enzyme to interact. Of course, if the substrate has not good affinity with the enzyme, how would you expect the, the product to be formed and the turnover rate to be high? So, of course, that means that affinity is actually a critical value to measure. And it so uh, seems that the affinity is actually inversely related to the Michaelis constant. In other words, we actually want uh, a low value for this Km in order to have high affinity. Or in, or in other words, if for some reason you want to perform research that you want to create a molecule which does not have good affinity for whatever reason, then you want the Km to be high. So basically, again, uh, inversely proportional. This will be more and more important later when we discuss enzyme inhibition. Now, I just want to mention that the pH and the temperature around the enzyme could actually alter the enzyme's activity. Now, in order to uh, display that, I have here plots that uh, give us the velocity as the dependent variable and the pH and the temperature, separately of course, as the uh, independent variables. And of course, the first question that, that uh, should be asked here is, why does pH and temperature in the first place affect enzyme activity? And the answer is simple. If you watch my introduction to enzymes, I mentioned that the enzymes that we will be talking um, all the way until this video are, are proteins. And remember that proteins have some property that we have studied before. Proteins can be denatured. I mentioned that I wouldn't be mentioning some denaturing agents, but this is the point where I can actually say that pH extremes, meaning ultra-acidic or ultra-basic pH levels, or extremes of temperature, very high, very hot temperatures, or very cold um, environments, very low temperatures, could actually disrupt the native conformation of the protein. And I mentioned before that if the protein is denatured, in this case, if the enzyme is denatured, the activity goes down. And doesn't activity equate to V? So that means that the V can be altered by denaturing agents like pH changes or temperature extremes, giving us things like this. Now, first going to the graph for the pH, we can see here it actually forms some kind of symmetrical uh, plot. Of course, it's not perfect because I just 
uh, drew it freehand, but it's supposed to be symmetrical in, in, in somehow like a normal distribution curve, but not exactly. And the highest point here can be traced here. Of course, is the, we can assume this is the maximal velocity in this plot. And then going down, this could be something that we call the optimum, optimum, optimal or optimum pH. Of course, meaning the pH where the enzyme works best. And then as your pH goes higher or lower, more basic or more acidic, some of the amino acids in the enzyme start to denature or, or start to change and the protein gets denatured and the activity starts to go down and down and down whether you go basic or acidic. Okay? Uh, in some books, they actually call this the bell-shaped curve. Now, the curve for the temperature versus velocity plot is a little different. It's not like a perfect bell shape because it's flatter at the left part and more steep at the right portion. Um, but first, knowing that this is the highest point in the plot, we could trace it here to get a temperature value that we can, you know, similar to this one, call the optimal temperature which obviously means the temperature where the enzyme works best. If your temperature is lower, lower, and even lower than the optimum temperature, you can assume that the kinetic energy goes down. Remember when the, 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 the temperature is low, the thermal energy is low, that would translate also to low kinetic energy. Well, of course, uh, skipping all complicated exceptions for physics, but that's the general idea. So, of course, if the, it's too cold, the enzymes won't move too much under the so-called collision theory in, 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 enzyme, in, in chemical kinetics. There's not going to be too much product form. And, of course, as you keep heating things up, collisions increase and increase, and the turnover rate goes up. That means the enzyme activity goes up until you reach this peak, wherein it suddenly drops here. Because if you heat it too much, at this point, the enzyme has been denatured by excess um, heat. Okay? It, it's disrupted, basically. So, it's quite convenient that in both cases, the explanation why the activity goes down from the optimal is denaturation. Finally, if we try to plot the velocity versus the concentration of the enzyme, this is a no-brainer. V here stands for enzyme velocity, right? And E stands for enzyme. So it would be common sense that if I have more enzymes, more, uh, more activity would be achieved because this one is essentially um, a direct output of this. So we get an infinitely straight line. Of course, that is assuming that the substrate also doesn't get depleted because otherwise we'll go back to something like the Michaelis plot here.